Reproductive Human Rights Commission for coordinating this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for continuing to to Parliament. In addition to Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, release, many other po po political prisoners uh, have been freed, and the current President, uh, Thane Sen, has softened a number of laws restricting freedom of expression, association, and assembly in the country since taking office uh, in mid-2011. Uh, in uh, September 2012, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor at the Capitol. In her acceptance speech, she singled out Tom Lantos as one man she would have liked to have met. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the work the late Tom Lantos did to, to, to promote freedom and democracy in Burma. Because of his and others' tireless efforts in 2008, uh, Tom Lanto, the Tom Lantos Block Burmese Jade Act was signed into law and has arguably been a contributing factor in the regime's decision to implement political reforms. Having noted these reforms and in efforts to re-engage, the, the United States has made several major changes to its policy towards Burma in the last two years. In 2011, Secretary Clinton became the first U.S. Secretary of State uh, to visit the country in half a century, and last year President Obama became the first U.S. President to ever uh, visit, visit Burma. Uh, since the parliamentary by-elections in 2012, the U.S. has been gradually easing its economic sanctions on Burma to allow for U.S. investments in the country and recently lifted sanctions on several Burmese banks. Earlier this month, the Burmese Army was invited for the first time to observe U.S.-led military training exercises in Thailand. While these reforms should not uh, be easily dismissed, I am particularly concerned by the ongoing serious human rights violations in the country. Uh, in a statement released last week by the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, uh, on, on, human, on the human rights situation in Burma, the rapporteur noted there are, and I quote, significant human rights shortcomings that remain unaddressed, unquote, uh, uh, after returning from the country. Reports continue of forced labor, uh, restrictions on freedom of expression and assembly, arbitrary land grabs and forced relocation, impunity for serious uh, violations, and over 200 uh, political prisoners remain in jail. Egregious abuses continue to be alleged uh, in, uh, in, 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 Kachin, uh, in, the, in Kachin State. In direct contravention of the ceasefire, the Burmese Army launched airstrikes against the Kachin Independence Army, the KIA, uh, near their headquarters in, in Liza last month, killing innocent civilians. The military also stand accused of destroying villages arbitrary detentions and torture, sexual abuse of women, employment of forced porters, and restricting access to humanitarian aid. The conflict in Kachin State uh, is not an isolated one, and repeated clashes with the military in other parts of Burma, including Shan, Chin, and Karen states, have resulted in displacement of thousands of people. The government of Burma must take immediate steps to hold perpetrators of these abuses accountable. The situation uh, in, in Rakhine State is also increasingly dire. Uh, after sectarian clashes last year that resulted in the deaths of, uh, of Rohingya and Rakhine people and the displacement of over, of over 115,000 people, the majority of whom are, 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 Ro are Rohingya, the government put a number of restrictions on the mobility of people and there remained limited access to humanitarian aid uh, in, uh, in Rakhine State. Today, many languish in poorly maintained camps, vulnerable to starvation and disease. I am particularly concerned by the increasing number of deaths of Rohingyas in the Indian Ocean fleeing the country by boat. For decades, the Rohingyas have endured systematic discrimination and to this day are denied citizenship in Burma. Just last week, Deputy, Immig De Deputy Immigration and Population Minister uh, uh, Kai Kai Win told the Burmese Parliament that Rohingyas are not a recognized ethnic minor minority in Burma. Yet, with the continued waiving of sanctions, many contend the pressure for the Burmese government to reform is dwindling. As United States companies proceed to invest in Burma, it is crucial that they ensure their operations do not contribute to human rights violations. This hearing will analyze the current human rights situation in Burma with a particular focus on the various human rights challenges the United States faces as it reengages re with the Burmese government and potentially the Burmese military. 
The U.S. government must ensure its investment and interactions in the country contribute to positive development. The U.S. government must also continue to insist that the Burmese government respects human rights and the rule of law. Um, so having said that, it is now time to hear from our witnesses. I would like to submit into the record any oral testimony along with written testimony provided by the witnesses today. In addition, I would like to submit into the record the written statement of Dr. Uh, Wakar uh, uh, Yudin, uh, the Director General of the uh, Arakan Rohingya Union, and, Mong, uh, and Mo Tun Kin, President of the Burmese Rohingya Organ Organization uh, UK, one of 25 member organizations of the Arakan Rohingya Union. Uh, and so the first witness I would like to uh, welcome is Assistant Secretary Michael Posner uh, uh, in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor and the State Department. Uh, Assistant Secretary, you are welcome to start and we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman McGovern. And I also want to thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, and steady support over the last three and a half years that I've been in this position and for your uh, lifelong commitment really to the issue of human rights. I also want to acknowledge, as you did, uh, the special role that uh, Congressman Lantos uh, played in the, in the Burma debate historically, and uh, it's very fitting that this hearing is before the Lantos Commission. Uh, as you know, the last 18 months have uh, brought a number of changes uh, to Burma from the release of hundreds of political prisoners to the revision of repressive laws, uh, things that many of us would have thought uh, unthinkable uh, even a couple of years ago. Uh, these developments have been a vindication of Aung San Suu Kyi's support for reform and now with the tide of reform she helped to put in motion moving forward, she remains a symbol of hope and freedom in Burma. Uh, today, our government is seeking to support both the government and people of Burma as they seize this opportunity for change. But we recognize that here as elsewhere, uh, change uh, is, uh, comes slowly and that there will be a long and bumpy road to get there. But as it does move forward, we continue to want to be a long-term partner in this reform process. Uh, last November, President Obama uh, visited uh, Burma and welcomed the progress that's being made, uh, and he ur urged further action. Uh, in the course of his visit, uh, the government of Burma uh, had, had committed to 11 substantial steps to deepen and advance the reform process. So I want to hear today talk about four areas where human rights issues uh, are playing themselves out and where progress still needs to be made. The first relates to political prisoners, which you also made reference to. Uh, we're engaged with uh, the government and have been over the last 18 months in an extensive way uh, in reviewing prisoner lists and presenting those lists and having a range of discussions with government officials. Uh, nearly 800 political prisoners have now been released, including most of the high-profile dissidents. But the story uh, does not end there. Uh, recently, the government formed a political prisoner review committee, which actually held its first meeting earlier this month. The work of the committee is not going to be easy, but its existence is a step forward, uh, and it has the potential uh, not only to deal with the specific cases, the 200 and some cases you mentioned, but also to be part of a healing process and a move towards national reconciliation. We really see three potential uh, benefits from this committee's work. First, it can accurately determine the number of remaining political prisoners and uh, prompt their unconditional release. Secondly, as the committee considers specific cases, it will have an opportunity to identify laws that need to be reformed as part of a broader law reform process. This is not part of the committee's initial mandate, but it can be an important collateral benefit as the society moves forward. And finally, the committee has the potential to help advance efforts to provide care and facilitate the reintegration of released prisoners. Uh, as, as in any situation where there are long-term detentions, people have a range of uh, economic, uh, psychological, social problems. The committee can help address those and we stand ready to help. 
The second broad area for us is the area of uh, law reform. Uh, the Constitution is a foundational document for any society and part of a broader effort to reform and build the rule of law. Uh, in the run-up to the 2015 national elections, we see there uh, being an opportunity for the people and government to debate and decide how to address these broader constitutional issues. A range of people within the country uh, have called for changes in the 2008 Constitution. We see this as an appropriate moment to have that discussion. On state. I, I have no illusions about the difficulty of addressing this particular issue, but I believe to my core that all human beings deserve human rights, and that includes each and every person in our con state. And lastly, I very much hope that we can continue to see the release of political prisoners. Um, they all need to be released so that they can participate in the furtherance of democracy uh, in their country. I'm glad there has been progress made in, in that direction, and I hope that progress will yield even uh, more results in the near future. I believe, like many of the witnesses, it is too soon to declare victory in Burma. If uh, these three issues can be addressed, however, I believe we will uh, be much closer to where the world hopes uh, Burma, Burma to be. And I believe or we will be much closer to a situation where all the people of Burma have a chance to realize the dream of, of a free, democratic, and multi-ethnic nation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this very important and timely hearing on human rights in, in Burma. Uh, as many of you in this room well know, uh, Ethnic and religious minorities uh, at this time, especially Christian minorities in particular, face some of the most severe of their persecutions in Burma. And we need to see serious political dialogue within the framework of a robust peace process to resolve the uh, ongoing conflicts toward Burma's ethnic and, and religious groups. And Mr. Chairman, for the full, for the sake of time, I, I will ask that my full statement be resubmitted for the record, and I'll give a, a condensed statement uh, here. It'll take only a few moments. Um, and I'm going to start, if it's all right, sir, with, uh, you know, just the realization that personal stories of many of the ethnic and religious minorities in Burma are horrifying, and they bring this to reality. Sometimes we keep this in sort of the, the theoretic uh, realm, and sometimes it's important uh, to share certain stories that uh, make it all real to us. And so I'll just share one that I believe is revealing of greater dynamics within Burma, uh, on the, and the, of course, ongoing violence in the ethnic regions. Uh, a grandmother sat alone in a church near Burma's Kachin, China border last spring and silently waited for the notoriously brutal Burma army to raid her village. Other Kachin villagers fled once they heard that the Burma army was approaching. But this grandmother was left behind. Her only protection was the sanctuary of the church. And when the Burma finally, uh, army finally, the Burma army, when the Burma army finally came to the village, they showed no mercy toward the 48-year-old grandmother. Over a period of three days, she was violently beaten with rifle butts, stabbed with knives, stripped naked, and gang raped. Another Kachin man who was captured while caring for his paralyzed wife was brought back to the village. And as he lay in the church with his hands and legs tied, he uh, witnessed uh, with horror this uh, attack on this helpless woman. Um, this vulnerable grandmother. The victims in the village church were left semi-conscious and the grandmother later suffered mental health problems of a severe nature. Uh, after reports of the torture were released, a spokesman from the Kachin Women's Association stated, quote, if the Burmese military, quote, the Burmese military can rape and kill ethnic women with impunity, close quote. Uh, Burma's deeply flawed 2008 Constitution, uh, Mr. Chairman, grants the Burma Army sweeping authority to commit atrocities against ethnic minorities and further, furthers the ethnic tensions. Uh, reform within Burma cannot occur, in my judgment, without substantial constitutional reform measures. Uh, I have the privilege of chairing the House Judiciary Committee uh, Constitution Subcommittee, and I believe strongly in the importance of constitutional protections to ensure fundamental freedoms. 
and to provide protection to its people. Uh, Burma's current constitution does neither and in fact works directly against many of its people. Uh, Article 20, which grants the Army authority over civilians and jurisdictions to safeguard, quote, unity, essentially provides carte blanche justification for the Burma Army's regular attacks against the civilian population in ethnic areas. And I think all of us could see a situation where Burma could revert to war and military rule unless the Constitution immediately addresses the underlying reasons for this ethnic conflict. Burma has a long road ahead, and the U.S. must continue to advocate for the full inclusion of vulnerable ethnic and religious groups within Burmese society and the political process. With our developing relationship with Burma, specific reform agenda items should be on the table, including the cessation of violence against the Chin, the Kachin, and Rohingya, and other ethnic and religious minority groups. As the U.S. continues to work closely with the Burmese government, Mr. Chairman, on these reforms, uh, we must ensure that legitimate ethnic and democracy leaders are included in those negotiations. Uh, comprehensive and effective dialogue on the overall situation in Burma cannot be conducted without these leaders. Burma desperately needs democratic systems that will guarantee democracy, human rights, rule of law, independence of judiciary, and ethnic minority rights. Moreover, the U.S. must be careful to take no action that could be interpreted, interpreted as an endorsement of any misconduct or human rights lapses by the Burmese government, particularly while the Burmese government is still dominated by the current and former milita military leaders with such a very brutal past. Mr. Chairman, true peace and progress in Burma can be achieved by nothing less than the complete cessation of violence uh, toward its ethnic and religious minorities. And with that, I would thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank both my colleagues. And um, I mean, let me just add just a, a few questions. But as you can see, I mean, we all continue to be very concerned about the human rights situation. We continue to be concerned about the behavior of the security forces in the military. Uh, and, um, and we are, you know, understand that this is a moment of opportunity uh, for, uh, for the government of, of, of Burma. Uh, to uh, you know, to, to move forward, um, but we also want to make sure that it's clear to the administration that uh, many of us up up here are also want to make it clear to the government of Burma that if in fact reforms do not move forward, if things slide backwards, then then you know then we then our then our re relaxation uh, of of, uh, restri of restrictions and sanctions um, be comes to a halt as well. You know that when it comes to human rights, we're not a cheap date. That when it comes to human rights, we're going to be we're going to be vigilant. We're going to be strong. We're going to be consistent. Um, and um, you know, and so you know th that there'll be no offering of, of military training or other assistance to the military uh, unless there are major reforms. Uh, that uh, things right now continue to be unacceptable. Well, let me ask a question. Uh, maybe uh, Assistant Secretary Posner, you can tackle this one uh, with regard to the recent draft uh, reporting requirements issued by the State Department for U.S. companies. Uh, what, if any, consequences or penalties will companies face if they provide incomplete or inaccurate information? And, uh, and what if they fail to report at all? Are the, are the co consequences limited to uh, monetary fines, or would a failure to comply with uh, General License 17 also implicate uh, whether an investor may legally continue to, to do business in Burma? And also, what, if any, uh, review will the State Department conduct uh, of information withheld from investors' public reports? Will there be any consideration of whether inappropriate exemptions are claimed? Um, <clears throat> thanks. There are a number of questions in there. Let me just first of all say that the uh, reporting requirements we call for responsible investment um, will go into effect this spring. First reports will be due in June. Uh, they require companies to uh, report on any investments over $500,000 and to talk about uh, human rights, environmental, uh, and anti-corruption due diligence procedures. 
Um, this is a first of its kind, uh, and our expectation is that the act of reporting, the act of making that information available, is going to encourage and push companies um, to both look at their own operations and to put due diligence procedures into place. There is no, um, there is no coercive authority, as you, as you put it or, or as you implied, but I think that this is going to be a, a first step to put, to put companies on notice. The U.S. government is paying attention to these issues. We have expectations. And I think a number of companies already have come to us and said, we want to figure out how to do this in a responsible way. It is a first step and it ought to be viewed that way. It will not solve all of the problems we're trying to address. Second thing I would say about it is that these reporting requirements are going to be effective no. uh, only if we're able to get other governments to join with us. One of the things I did while I was in Burma last week was to meet with a number of like-minded governments. Um, and to date, there isn't a single government that we've talked to that's going to follow suit. The European Parliament is discussing this. We've had some preliminary discussions, but I think this needs to be something that international companies across the board are doing. So I, my answer to you would be, this is a first step. It's something that's unprecedented in the way we're operating. I think a number of companies realize that we're serious about it. Uh, we will wait and see what kind of reports we get, and if it's not sufficient and it doesn't change um, the environment or the behavior, then we have to look at the next steps. No, and I appreciate that, and I think I think the concern that some of us have is that there's not enough teeth in it, um, you know, and that um, and my hope is that everybody will comply and 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 do the right thing. But um, you know, I'm I'm just trying to think of history, um, and uh, some some businesses are you know uh, do the right thing, some don't, um, and what we we, we want to do is in, in encourage you know progress and and reform, and um, you know and and. You know there ought to be a consequence uh, for somebody that comes comes in there and um, you know and uh, is not a good player. So I, I would uh, let me ask Mr. Murphy, uh, Assistant Secretary Fernandez um, was photographed this week shaking hands with a Burmese business leader who was on this SDN list, the specially designated nationals list uh, that are owned uh, uh, owned by military cronies who were identified as such in State Department cables. How is the State Department coordinating across bureaus and offices to ensure that one strategic objective, and that is the promotion of U.S. investment in Burma, does not undermine our overall foreign policy objective of reducing human rights abuses and promoting stability and reform in Burma? And uh, more specifically, how can the empowerment and enrichment of people who are known to be corrupt and associated with military abuses uh, promote our foreign policy goals in Burma? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and first, I can uh, assure you that this is a whole-of-government approach, both within the State Department and across a wide range of agencies who bring to bear great expertise uh, to lend to the reform effort there in Burma. There are good actors in, in Burma, and there are actors who are a challenge. And as a result, we have a process managed by our Treasury Department, Office of Foreign Assets Control, to target individuals and entities who thwart reform, perpetuate abuses, and continue these bad practices of the past. However, we want to encourage change behavior. And much like former generals shed their uniforms and put on civilian attire, mm -hmm. and they have taken on a new role and are leading this reform, we think the same needs to be the case for economic managers. It's really a handful of cronies who have controlled the economy. They're not going to go away. We will target them. They won't benefit from our easing, but they, in fact, need to change their behavior so that all of Burma and all of its people can benefit. I think what was most important about Assistant Secretary Fernandez's visit to Burma was not a photograph, to be honest, mm -hmm. was his message. His message was that Burmese economic operators need to address corruption, need to apply international standards of transparency, and need to conduct the economy in a way that helps and doesn't contradict reform. And that's the way forward. Uh, I'm not uh, blind to the fact that cronies have contributed to the military regime practices in the past, but I'm also hopeful they can change their behavior, much like many generals have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. And sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I think 
I, I, you know, and again, I think you know, th this is a delicate time, and you know, and photographs and meetings and you know um, send signals that um, you know, uh, th you know, that the people view in a certain way. And I think, um, and again, I, mean, I think we, if we, if human rights is going to be the central part of our our policy here, um, I think we need to be very vigilant of who you know we're shaking hands with and who we're being photographed with. But um, let me ask another question for either one of you. I mean, it go back, goes back to this issue of, of the military, which, um, you know, is a great concern. I mean, um, you know, a fundamental reform necessary to uh, future peace and stability uh, in Burma is the total restructuring of the military, and I think both of you have talked about the, the challenges there. Uh, there needs to be civilian control of the military, which continues to rebuke uh, President Thane Sen uh, in areas such as the Kachin state. And I guess... Uh, wh how, how, what are we doing? How, do, how can the United States government help ensure military reform will take place in a transparent and a fair and a democratic manner? And what are the benchmarks that the government of Burma must meet in terms of military reform before the United States um, uh, will begin offering training and other assistance to its, to its military? And, um, you know, I, I had mentioned this to Assistant Secretary Posen before about you know, the uh, about some in the Burmese uh, military being invited to observe some U.S. military operations, and, and there was some concern about what that signal was. But I mean, I, I think I want to make sure that that the that the Burmese army understands that there that they that that there are certain things that have to happen before we're going to do anything that's going to be anything near a you know a a relationship. And are there lessons learned from other countries that could be applied to military uh, reform in Burma? And um, you know, and, 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 and what, in, in your opinion, what's the best way to encourage the Burmese military to reform and go forward? So a couple of things on that. Um, this comes back to uh, one of the issues that Congressman uh, Crowley mentioned in his opening statement: the uh, the really uh, crisis situation in Kachin. I think we have to start by being honest in our. Um, in our exchanges, both privately and publicly, uh, when the military <clears throat> commits abuses, as they have in Kachin, especially since December, when uh, for the first time in a long time they used military helicopters and jets to attack uh, Kachin Independence Army positions, um, and where there has been uh, a heavy toll on women and children uh, who have been abused. Um, we need to say that strongly. We need to push, as we did when we were there last week, for uh, humanitarian access. Uh, one of the ways to mitigate uh, the damage and, and bad behavior is for there to be uh, neutral parties on the scene. They both help provide humanitarian support, food and medicine and the like, but they also provide witnesses and make, make it more difficult for those abuses to occur. We have a crisis in Kachin, and it's critical that we stay the course and make our views known and really push for that kind of humanitarian assistance. As I said, we just began last week to see the first uh, convoy uh, from the ICRC and also from OCHA going up there, but that needs to be expanded greatly, both for international organizations and for Burmese um, uh, humanitarian organizations. The second thing I would say is that we need to be um, clear when our military engages, it's engaged in the context of trying to send clear signals about the importance of human rights. <clears throat> I mentioned that we had a uh, first ever human rights dialogue in October in Napida. Um, we had with us a general from uh, PACOM, General Wyshynski, um, who spoke in very eloquent terms about the U.S. military's commitment to civilian control of the military, command and control procedures, training, accountability, accountability for abuses. Um, he was there not in promoting a mill-mill uh, exchange or a particular kind of a training exercise. He was there and very deliberately as first engagement was part of a human rights dialogue. And the message was heard loud and clear by a whole row of generals, uh, Burmese generals who were sitting in the audience. We had a separate meeting with the Deputy Minister of Defense to which he invited me, and that was again the message. So I think the first, the second thing for us is we ought to engage we ought to engage first and foremost from principles of human rights. 
And as the relationship evolves, I think we have to recognize that the Burmese military has operated outside of a professional structure for a long time, and they need to have greater exposure to our military. But we need to be careful how we do it, and we need to calibrate our engagement in a way that recognizes that they also need to step up and change some of their practices. Robert, do you, have you want to add? Or? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I would just emphasize that for 50 years, the Burmese military controlled every aspect of government, every mm -hmm. ministry, every local level government office, every embassy abroad. So this is a transition uh, that is very, very substantial to get the military out of a lot of these roles, and not to mention the economy, which I alluded to over uh, previously. Uh, we are, I think, some time away from training. Although we can envision with the pace and scope of reform, someday hopefully we might be able to get there. We are some distance from that. In the media, in the uh, interim, I would agree with my colleague that it's all about exposure. The Burmese Tatmadaw, the armed forces, have had no exposure to peacekeeping, to humanitarian assistance, mm -hmm. to playing a proper role of an armed forces subordinate to civilian mm -hmm. rule. So we do need to be creative to ensure, as we hear from many voices inside the country, who plead with us to please expose them to these kind of practices so that they don't continue operating in a vacuum and perpetuating the bad practices of the past. Mm -hmm. I just have one, just one final question. Uh, um, going back to the Tom Lantos Burmese Block Jade Act, uh, you know, the, under that act, the administration has the duty to add people to, specially design, to the specially designated nationals list. Uh, as new information comes in about human rights abuses. And uh, several credible human rights organizations have put out reports about serious uh, rights abuses committed by Burmese military officials, including uh, by Chief Lieutenant General Mi and So uh, and Northern Commander Brigadier General uh, Tun Tun No in, in Kachin State in the past few years. And yet these individuals continue to remain off the SDN list, uh, even though they have appeared on Australian, UK, and EU sanctions lists in the past. And early last year, former Secretary Clinton said that the uh, SDN list is due for an update, and yet no individual names have been added to the list since 2010. Um, by failing to update the SDN list uh, when new information exists about rights abuses, uh, isn't the administration kind of in violation of the Jade Act? Uh, and if, if not, I'm, I'm curious to know why. <clears throat> we think that the, uh, the SDN list remains an important tool, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, and since we readjusted the criteria last year to take into account the reform process so that we could be calibrated going ahead, in other words, target those who obstruct reform, perpetuate human rights abuses, and continue military trade with North Korea, we want this tool to be part of our calibrated approach. So in fact, we have named uh, several entities uh, to the list. Uh, again, Treasury Department's uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control is the primary uh, mechanism here. Um, but we've also removed a couple of names because, of course, we are trying to encourage change behavior. Um, I think in the case of individuals where there can be documented evidence, our Treasury Department, our administration would like to hear that. These cases need to be very well documented. Information is hard to come by. There are plenty of allegations of abuse, but to build the case, really what is a legal case, I think our Treasury Department would tell us we need good information, and I think we would welcome that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, the, the two individuals I mentioned, um, I mentioned because a number of human rights organizations believe that there is credible evidence, and, um, and, and, and I just would encourage you to kind of look into this, if you, if, if you would, uh, um, uh, because I do think, uh, it is important to maintain that list and to make sure it's current, um, because I, I think it, just as it is a, a it just as when people, you know, change, you you want to have an opportunity to get off the list when people are, are still misbehaving and uh, you know and not respecting people's rights, you that ought to, that, that that ought to be a consequence. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to look at those two individuals. Um, having said that, I, 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 let me yield to my colleague, uh, Mr. Crowley, if he has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of. And maybe not for an immediate answer, but I was kind of piggybacking on that. In terms of what Mr. Franks uh, 
was speaking about that particular incident. Um, are you hearing similar stories of abuse, of sexual abuse, of, of violence, uh, and um, have you been able to substantiate them as well? And just to put that in the back and maybe think about that for a moment, but. Um, but in the ethnic areas. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and as severely as what he's speaking about, that's what the, the Army has been doing? Yeah, I mean, we met with uh, a number of uh, Kachin activists, for example, including some people from the churches, and they described uh, a range of things. Uh, churches being used as, uh, as military bases, people being abused, uh, women in particular being abused. And the Army denying it? Uh, the army uh, denies it. I mean, I can't. We did not. I did not meet this time with the Ministry of Defense. But in general, the army would say that you know those things haven't happened. Any back channeling of acknowledgement that this is? Yeah, you know, one uh, one of the things that was interesting when we had the. I've done a lot of human rights dialogues with a lot of different countries, and many in many cases you feel that the discussions are scripted. Um, we had very frank discussions in October with a wide range of people, including military. And we were not shy about expressing our concerns about exactly these sorts of things. And we got past the level of generality, and we did not have um, a, a blanket denial. We had a very serious discussion about where they are, what they need to do, and the fact that these, these things are going on and they're systematic. That's certainly been our position and will continue to be. Um. My understanding is the result of President Obama's trip uh, to Rangoon, a number of commitments were made on the human rights uh, level. Uh, could you let us know where things stand right now with respect to the Burmese government's uh, uh, response or commitment to those, to those uh, pledges? Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, there were 11 commitments made. Um, we were particularly focused on four or five of them in the visit I just took. One relates to release of political prisoners. You mentioned it as well. And uh, they've released uh, approximately 800 political prisoners. We still have a list that has more than 200 people on it. But more importantly, we've said to the government, we can't just keep going back and back with lists. There needs to be a process that the Burmese own. And what they've done is to create a committee which has eight government officials and eight from outside of government, essentially people who are themselves political prisoners, including some longtime political prisoners. They held their first meeting last Saturday. And our hope is that that process will both lead to more releases, unconditional releases. It'll also provide a place to have a conversation. A number of the people still on the list are from the ethnic areas, um, some of whom have probably engaged in some of the violence that's gone on. But this can be then part of a reconciliation process. It's also a way to look at law reform, because some of the people are uh, held in prison under laws that probably and more, more than likely need to be reformed. That's not in the mandate of the committee, but we think it's a useful byproduct. And then there are a range of issues relating to uh, reintegrating uh, former prisoners into the system. They have all sorts of issues. So that's one issue. There really has been a dedicated uh, effort on our part, and it's been matched by serious discussion with the government on prisoners. Second issue is access for the Red Cross. The Red Cross went into its first prison uh, several months ago um, and had unlimited access without constraints. They've now got a commitment from the government that they're going to be allowed into 36 prisons and labor camps, and they're gearing up to do that. They had the first humanitarian convoy uh, also go into the Kachin uh, con uh, conflicted area again last week. So our hope is that that access is extended both to them and to OCHA, the UN uh, 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 agency that deals with humanitarian affairs, as well as private voluntary organizations that provide humanitarian assistance. So that's the third area, access um, and dealing with the humanitarian uh, crisis in the conflict areas. The fourth area we focused on is the creation of an office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Government's made a commitment to do it. 
while we were there, representatives of the Office of the High Commissioner were in Burma. They had discussions with the government. Those discussions are ongoing. We pressed hard and we continue to be told that those commitments will be honored and that that uh, is underway. There's still some issues to work out, but I think it's also a very positive sign. The last thing which Patrick mentioned, which I think is also critical, and it goes to this issue of the role of the military and the economy, the role of the cronies, um, there is, uh, we press for a greater openness and transparency. Uh, we have an open government initiative, which was initiated by President Obama. Um, to, to be honest, this is a early stage of a discussion about what is transparency in government look like. But I think if we're going to encourage uh, Burma to be a modern economy and a modern democracy, they've got to open up their process. And so part of what we're also trying to do, law reform, range of things we're doing, we're trying to create a more open uh, society based on the rule of law and transparency. But we're, we are moving on all 11 of those commitments, and they're at various stages. I've just given you five of the 11, but that's the general sense of where we are. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I just have a, just a couple more questions, if I could. Um, in terms of the conflict in the, in the Kachin uh, region, Kachin state, uh, is there anything that, you, that the president, our president, our government uh, can do to pressure the Burmese government and their military to, 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 to bring about a, a real ceasefire and to end the conflict? Or are we looking at another decade of war and violence in that region? Yeah, I don't want to predict um, how long it's going to take, but I would say that, and this is what we said to people both in the government and to people outside, um, it's very hard to achieve a meaningful, sustainable peace uh, when people are still shooting at each other, when, you know, people, uh, innocent, uh, you know, women and children are being uh, raped and killed. So the first thing is to try to diffuse the conflict, to try to create an environment where you have a ceasefire and where you have humanitarian assistance. Um, I think the humanitarian access point is so important because uh, it provides confidence building on both sides. It also deals with the urgency of the moment where you have tens of thousands of people who are essentially in a very compromised position. So step one, get the access for the humanitarian. Step two, create a, a ceasefire, even if it's tenuous, and then begin in the longer stage to uh, begin to talk about a more permanent political solution. But we're ways off from that, honestly. I think it's really critical that we deal with the urgent piece right now because a lot of people are suffering. Right. And I know Patrick feels as though I've been neglecting him. Um, I'm not going to ask him to respond to my last question because it, in part, pertains to his position. Uh, the Jade Act um, that I was honored to, uh, to work with Mr. Lantos on uh, included a provision um, th that created the position of the Special Envoy in Burma. And, um, however, that position has not been filled since uh, uh, Ambassador Mitchell was appointed ambassador. Uh, Patrick uh, Murphy is now serving as interim uh, envoy. And uh, I believe that the focus attention of the envoy is a good idea while reforms are still fragile and while much progress has yet to be made. Um, does the administration have plans to uh, make Patrick's position permanent and that he should act as though he's not here right now as we're talking about him? But, and let me also say, despite my concerns and reservations about the advancement of human rights, I do appreciate uh, Mr. Murphy's enthusiasm for the possibilities of change in Burma, and I don't want to diminish that either. So I thought it was important to state that. But, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you could respond. Sure. I don't. Uh, I don't think there is a. I know there is some internal discussion, but no final d decision. But one thing I would say is that we're in a somewhat different position than we were even a year ago because we have, for the first time in what 30 years, an ambassador there, and we have a really outstanding ambassador. Derek Mitchell is is. A good a colleague as I've worked with anywhere in the world. This agenda that we're talking about today is his agenda. And so to me, the important thing is that we have a presence on these issues, that we have a sustained commitment to pursuing these issues as a priority. Uh, and I'm very confident that uh, Ambassador Mitchell in the front line uh, is doing that every day in, in his tenure in Rangoon. 
Uh, Patrick has been uh, also a fantastic colleague, and I think we're now in the process of really trying to figure out going forward what's the right constellation. But the important thing is from the president on down, this has been something that's occupied a huge amount of attention. I was with Secretary Clinton a year ago in December when she went. Patrick was there. We have not neglected Burma. We have put a lot of time and attention, and I feel really proud of what we've accomplished. We have a long way to go. We're at the beginning of a long road. But uh, there is no doubt that the human rights agenda has been front and center as we deal with this country. I, I would just let, uh, say that I, I don't mis want to be misinterpreted as, as to um, suggesting that I believe or that even the commission believes that uh, there's been neglect of Burma. I don't think there has been, not at the high level that Secretary Clinton's visit, both the president's visit as well. Uh, it's more, I think, from our vantage point or view in helping to craft the legislation that we did that for a reason, was to give you more resource uh, and more uh, on the ground uh, intelligence uh, to this particular uh, issue, which ha is multifaceted as well. It's, uh, and, and believe me, I know that uh, Ambassador Mitchell uh, is doing a great job and he cut his teeth in many respects as the, uh, uh, as, uh, the uh, special envoy. Um, so uh, that, that's why in which we, we asked that question. If, if not to be interpreted at all, because Patrick is on the ground anyway, so it's, it's not that, uh, from that position, I take that, that point. But thank you. Uh, if I could, Mr. Crawley, I, and, and I think I can be uh, appropriately neutral, uh, because I am a, a career senior foreign service officer and eventually will, you know, assume new responsibilities on other issues. Uh, I, I will defer to the White House, of course, on, on uh, Good move. specifically answering Good your move. question. <laughs> but what I can offer, um, you know, of course, the JDAC mandate was, uh, was issued in a different era. Uh, we have increased our personnel at Embassy Rangoon. Uh, within the State Department, we have increased our personnel working exclusively on Burma. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a whole-of-government approach. I can tell you from personal experience back when I was the Burma desk officer in the 1990s, uh, there was really just about one person who would travel to Burma um, or attend uh, events related to Burma, and, and that was the desk officer. Now we have um, a multitudinous array of agencies, of experts who are focused on this effort, and, and I think it is achieving good results because we have as a government, as a country, a lot to bring to the effort. Uh, and as Secretary Posner uh, referred with an ambassador in Rangoon, you know, a good portion of the action has shifted there appropriately inside the country. So circumstances have evolved a bit. Can I just add to that? I, I appreciate all that. Um, you know, and, and if, if the family of prisoners uh, or victims of violence or people who are suffering in these regions have access to high-level individuals within the State Department uh, and, and through the embassy, uh, that's all well and good. I think to some degree having a special envoy who may be um, not as tied down in many respects in, term, in terms of formality as an ambassador may be, uh, may be able to do even, um, even more uh, aggressive acts, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the point I'm making in terms of that suggestion, and I know that uh, Ambassador Mitchell was incredibly aggressive uh, as the uh, special envoy, and so that's, that's why I offer that suggestion. Well, let me, let me thank you both, and uh, not only for being here today, but f for your work um, on this issue in particular. Um, you know, I think that, I think we are like-minded, um, you know, and I, and I appreciate um, your help and your assistance to try to move Burma forward. And um, I know that uh, both of you, like all of us, care deeply about human rights. Um, but, um, and, and, and I, I want to echo what my colleague said about, uh, you know, that I, I don't want to diminish anybody's optimism that Burma is moving forward or can continue to move forward. We want that to happen. But um, there is a tendency sometimes um, as we try to aggressively pursue economic uh, relations and military relations to sometimes shortchange human rights. I'm not saying you, this applies to you, but I'm, I'm looking over the kind of the history of our, of our involvement with other countries in the world. And we don't want that to happen here because really for Burma to move forward, I think you agree with me that human rights has to be uh, at, the, at, at the center. It is an absolute must. And I know both of you feel like we do that uh, that we need to continue to focus uh, attention on, uh, on human rights. 
We need to continue to point out who the human rights abusers are. Uh, we, we need to uh, re reward and pat on the back those who are changing in a positive way. Uh, but, uh, but human rights has to be at the center. And um, so uh, we, we are cautiously optimistic, and, uh, but we will continue to meet on this issue, and there will be other hearings in the, in the future uh, on this, just to kind of get a sense of where we are. And I just finally say uh, again to my friend Mike Posner, thank you for your incredible service to our country and to the cause of human rights. And um, you have been an incredible asset to this uh, commission, but uh, I think to the, to the Congress in general, and we're going to miss you, and good luck. Thank you very much. We're now going to call our next panel, um, Ms. Ah No, uh, Deputy Coordinator, Kachin Women's As Association of Thailand, Mr. Marcos uh, Simons, Legal Director, uh, Earth Rights International, Mr. Tom Milanowski, Washington Director for Human Rights Watch, Watch. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Quigley, Executive Director of the U.S. Campaign for Burma, and the Honorable Tom Andrews, uh, President United to End Genocide. Hey, all right. Uh, Ms. Ah, no, we will begin with you. And we'll make sure you get the microphone on and ready to go. Yes, thank you. Welcome, and we're honored to have you here. Thank you. Um, I would like to say thank you to Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for inviting me to um, testify today. I am from Michinam, the capital of Kachin State home of the Gachin people and most of the Christian minority of Burma. In June 2011, the Burmese army broke a 17 years long ceasefire with the Gachin Independence Army, also called KIA. Since then, troops from over 140 Burmese battalion have launched a violent operation in Gachin State and Northern Shan State. And they use heavy artillery and also aircraft. Over 100,000 people have been displaced, including my 78 years old grandmother, who spent her earlier life fleeing the civil war and is once again homeless. Last month, I was in Gachintao, Liza, on the border with China, a town where 20,000 civilians live, including over 10,000 displayed villagers who have been denied refuge in China. On January 14, she landed in a residential area of Liza, killed three villagers, and injured four people, including two children. The Burmese army has deliberately tortured, kidnapped, and killed civilians, and used Thai soldiers, burned down all villages and churches, and they also committed widespread sexual violence in Gachin and other ethnic areas. Since June 2011, my organization has documented the rape of 64 women and girls in 17 townships in Gachin State, committed by 14 Burmese battalion. Among these, there were many cases of gang rape. About half of victims were also killed. But Ms. Soja told Vilija that they have been ordered to rape women. The fighting and human rights abuses have caused much displacement. 364 villages are now partially or completely deserted. About 66,000 
internally displaced people, also called IDP, are taking shelter in the KIA control area. And they are receiving hardly any aid from the international community because the Burmese government has refused to allow humanitarian access to these areas. Last October, international aid to the IDP camp addressed only 4% of the food need. Most aid is being provided by community-based organizations who are struggling to keep up with growing need. There's a lack of food, lack of proper sanitation, spread of disease, and not enough medical supply. In the first three weeks of January 2013, in Liza alone, 10 babies died of diarrhea. There is 100% impunity for these human rights abuses, and Burmese government has passed no legislative or institutional reform to address or prevent of such crimes. Even the Myanmar National Human Rights Commission publicly declared that it would not investigate any crimes committed in ethnic areas. To address this growing humanitarian crisis and each these horrible human rights abuses, the U.S. must change its policy in, in Burma. First, we ask that you allocate U.S. aid money to community-based organizations providing assistance to IDP in KIA control area. They are the only group with a, a sustained access to vulnerable community in Gachin. Second, the U.S. should publicly call for a UN-led commission of inquiry to investigate crime against humanity and war crimes in get, taking place in Gachin, Gachin State and through of Burma. Without this, human rights violations will continue because there are no consequences for the perpetrators. That the U.S. should be an independent third party in the peace negotiation between the Burmese government and KIA. And even though the KIA and Burmese government have met formally 10 times, the Burmese government continued to make promise of ceasefire and humanitarian access that they do not enforce. So we therefore need an independent third party to be an, a monitor and guarantor for this negotiation. Finally, the U.S. must maintain existing sanction against Burma and renew any sanction that will expire. The U.S. had previously declared that for sanctions to be lifted, Burma had to release all political prisoners and stop hostility and seek true political settlement in ethnic areas. This target has not been met, so sanctions must remain in place. Thank you for your attention and support for the people of Burma. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Simons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to address business-related human rights issues in Burma. Since investment sanctions were lifted last year, American multinationals such as General Electric have already invested in Burma, while U.S. oil super majors are anticipating upcoming auctions of oil and gas blocks. A strong economy is vital for the well-being of the Burmese people, but unfortunately, investment in Burma has often been associated with conflict and human rights abuses. One major concern is displacement of local communities through the arbitrary confiscation of land for business use. In the past few years, the government has increased the pace of land confiscation and weakened the legal framework protecting small farmers. The majority of the Burmese people rely on rural farmland for their livelihoods, but in recent years, private companies have taken upwards of two million acres of farmland, typically with inadequate compensation or no compensation at all. This trend is likely to be exacerbated by the new legal framework for land. Under the 2008 Constitution, all land is ultimately owned by the state, and three laws passed last year as part of the legal reform process, the farmland law, the vacant fallow and virgin land law, and the foreign investment law, make it easier for the government to confiscate land and hand it over to private companies, including foreign investors. And challenges to land confiscations can only be brought to the same administrative committees 
that likely ordered the confiscations in the first place. They cannot be brought to the courts. Major drivers of land confiscation include plantation agriculture, hydropower dams, and natural resource extraction, including oil, gas, and mining. The Let Padang copper mine near Monya in central Burma illustrates how land confiscation for foreign investment can become a flashpoint for conflict. The mine is operated by a Chinese company, and local communities have strongly opposed plans to expand the mine due to concerns for land confiscation and environmental contamination. Last November 29th, security forces led a violent attack on protest camps at the mine, severely injuring nearly 50 protesters. Many victims were Burmese monks or B Buddhist monks who su suffered severe burns, and groups have reported the use of white phosphorus incendiary weapons. Unfortunately, the Monya incident is not unique. Just yesterday, the New York Times reported on a violent clash over land confiscation by a private company in a town in the Irrawaddy Delta. Oil and gas projects, especially those involving the construction of pipelines, have also led to land conflicts as well as severe human rights abuses. In the 1990s, Total and the U.S. oil company Unical, which is now Chevron, built the Yadana gas pipeline in southern Burma, relying on military units for security. Victims of forced labor, rape, torture, and murder by pipeline security forces sued Unical in U.S. courts in a major human rights lawsuit. Now, similar abuses, including severe and widespread forced labor, have been documented on the new Shui oil and gas pipelines, which run from the shores of Rakhine State through Shan State all the way to China, including zones of conflict with the Kachin Independence Army. These oil and gas projects also involve partnerships with the state oil company, MOGE, which operates with little transparency. Billions of dollars in revenues from MOGE projects remain missing from official government accounts. These problems should serve as a warning to U.S. oil companies considering investment in Burma. The State Department's new reporting requirements for responsible investment in Burma are a good start, but they do suffer from weaknesses. Investors must disclose some basic information about land acquisition, payments to the Burmese government, and policies on human rights issues, but as the chairman recognized, there are no specific measures for enforcement of the reporting requirements, and corporations can unilaterally designate material as confidential. The Secretary Posner mentioned that the reporting requirements uh, are weakened somewhat by the fact that they only apply to U.S. companies, and we have been unable to get our allies to apply similar requirements. But one solution to this problem would be to apply the reporting re requirements to all companies listed on U.S. stock exchanges. Unfortunately, the administration rejected this approach early on. Thus, Congress should continue to hold hearings on the impact of investment in Burma and should maintain and strengthen laws that allow accountability in U.S. courts for human rights abuses in Burma, such as the Alien Tort Statute. Finally, I'd like to, to touch upon the role of international financial institutions, especially the World Bank, which resumed lending to Burma last year. Unfortunately, the first major loan project to Burma, the Community Driven Development Project, has already been the subject of a civil society complaint to the bank for lack of adequate consultation. The project also lacks an adequate land compensation and resettlement framework. Project documents suggest that land may be acquired through, quote unquote, voluntary land donations. This is an alarming term because for many years the Burmese military regime referred to forced labor as, quote, voluntary labor. Thus, we urge Congress to use its oversight over the World Bank, as well as the Asian Development Bank, to require the U.S. Executive Director to support comprehensive engagement and consultation in loans to Burma and to support reform of the land law framework in Burma. In short, despite progress on some human rights issues, business-related abuses, especially in the context of land confiscation, remain a serious problem in Burma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Melanowski. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, for having us here um, and your continuing focus on Burma. American policy towards Burma has been reasonably successful for over 20 years, uh, as we're seeing now in these developments. I would say in large part because the Congress has helped to make that policy. Successive State Departments have embraced it, but I don't think the policy would ever have been made uh, on that side of, uh, 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 of, of the Capitol. So, so please keep it up. Um, I, 
I was in Burma uh, in January for the second time in the last uh, year, and I, I, I do share the sense of amazement that, that everybody who has worked on this issue for many years has to see how much has changed. Uh, Secretary Posner talked a bit about this political prisoner mechanism, which is uh, very much a work in progress, and, and yet here you have around one table representatives of the police and the judiciary and the people who they imprisoned uh, over the years, in some cases to 50, 70, 80 years, and they're talking about finding the last of their colleagues who are still in prison and getting them out. There is something, I think, profoundly inspiring about that that we, we need to recognize. Um, so Burma is getting there, getting to where we all hoped and prayed that it would get, but it has not gotten there by any stretch of the imagination. It's important to remember Burma is not a democracy. In, indeed, it retains virtually all of the laws, if not the practices, of, uh, of a dictatorship. And then there are the continuing human rights uh, abuses that, um, that others uh, have mentioned, and, and I'll, uh, I'll mention again in a, in a moment. Um, the changes that have come about have come about because of the goodwill of a very small number of people in the government. They have not been institutionalized. If you had a different small group of people in the government, there would be no checks against a return to authoritarian rule. And the most important thing, none of this is going to be settled until 2015, when Burma holds its first nationwide, we hope, free and fair elections um, to elect a parliament, um, the first chance that the opposition will have to actually form uh, a government. So it's tempting. In, in a world of terrible news to showcase Burma as a success. It can be, I hope it will be. Uh, in a few years, I hope we'll be talking about the model that Burma uh, creates for China and for Vietnam. But we're not gonna help Burma get there if we hype it too soon. That's my main message today. Um, until then, what we have to focus on is encouraging through pressure and assistance, the government to meet its commitments. And as Congressman Crowley mentioned before, we now actually have a set of commitments, very concrete ones, that the President of Burma made to the President of the United States. That's important, and it's a good way of framing our discussion going forward. So what, what were some of those uh, commitments? First of all, on ongoing ethnic conflict, President Thane Sein promised to our president that he would pursue a durable ceasefire in Kachin State uh, and other areas to de-escalate violent conflict and allow humanitarian access. As we've heard, humanitarian access seems to have just begun in the last week. So knock on wood, that will uh, continue. Um, but as we know, offensive operations by the Army, despite that promise from the president, have continued, including shelling and airstrikes uh, until very recently. And they have continued not just despite what Thane said, Sane said to the United States, but despite repeated um, calls by the President of Burma for a ceasefire. Now, how does that happen, that the President calls for the ceasefire and the Army um, doesn't respect it? Well, actually, it means that the Burmese Constitution is working exactly the way it was written to work, because under the Constitution, the Army does not have to take orders from the civilian government. It's a fundamental problem. Then you have the attacks on the Rohingya Muslims uh, in the Arakan state. Again, there was a promise here made directly to President Obama that the state would take decisive action to prevent violent attacks, hold accountable the perpetrators, work to meet the humanitarian needs of the people, uh, and address the political dimensions, including the granting of citizenship to the Rohingya uh, Muslims. Now, since then, there have been no major outbreaks of new violence, but there's also been no progress at all in addressing the causes of the violence, including dealing with those very, very important questions of citizenship. We still have over 100,000 people in camps. The rainy season is, season is coming. That is going to be a moment of great crisis um, from a humanitarian uh, point of view. Uh, we have uh, thousands of people taking to the seas, um, at least hundreds that we know of dying. Um, there needs to be a lot of effort, including diplomacy with other countries uh, in the region, Malaysia and Thailand, 
on this, this painful, painful question of uh, the Rohingya Muslims. Um, political prisoners, there was a pledge to create by December this mechanism that, that has been already discussed. It was created in February, a little bit late. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. Um, one very important uh, point is we're not just talking, unfortunately, about the legacy political prisoner cases that were inherited from the old regime. There have also been new cases. Uh, people who have been imprisoned in the last few months for engaging in peaceful assembly, but without a permit under the new law that the Burmese parliament passed. So there, we may be adding to the list of political prisoners even as we're subtracting from it, unless this mechanism can get to work really, really quickly. Um, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the promise was simple, they get to set up an office. And it's important because having this institution there gives us a built-in capacity from the UN on the ground to monitor these ethnic conflicts uh, around the country. And there, I, I'm afraid that Assistant Secretary Prosner was a little bit too optimistic. The, the government has stalled uh, in terms of meeting uh, this commitment, and we can talk about that uh, a bit more if, if you like. And then the really big issue um, is the rule of law. Um, you, you go to Rangoon today, um, Congressman, you will meet so many inspiring people starting NGOs and legal aid societies and political groups and, and, and it's wonderful and inspiring and it is all illegal because the laws that underpin the military dictatorship that makes, make it illegal for people to send you an email about what's going on in the Kachin state uh, or to say or do anything that might be interpreted as undermining the unity of the state or criticizing the military, all those laws are still in place. The judges that sentence these people to prison are still the same judges. Um, and then there's the Constitution and the, 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 um, the directing role that it gives to the military over virtually everything that matters in terms of security in the country. The military can dismiss the president. Um, and the military also has veto power over any changes to the Constitution that give it the power. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 there. Um, now, when I mention all these problems, my, my point is not to offer a wholesale critique of the reform effort in Burma. Moving from dictatorship to democracy in just two years is, I think, virtually impossible. I think we need to be patient with the pace of reform. But just as we acknowledge that it will take time, we also need to take our time in the way that we respond. And that's where I think a lot of us share a concern. So yes, let's respond positively to actions by the Burmese government, but not move faster to transform our policies than they are moving to transform their country. So yes, let's encourage investment, but not open the floodgates to billions of dollars that they can't absorb, and it's just going to fuel corruption if it's too much too soon. Um, yes, let's ease sanctions, but let's be wary of lifting them on a schedule that has more to do with our desire to declare foreign policy success than with what's actually happening on the ground. In practice, that means uh, that, means that the legislative framework that, that you all write every year um, should be renewed, the Jade Act and also the various presidential uh, executive orders, at least through the parliamentary elections in 2015, as well as the reporting requirements and the SDN list. Um, the SDN list should be managed in a dynamic way. So yes, people should be dropped off the list as their behavior changes, as the witnesses were saying, but you are absolutely right to press them on these commanders of the military in the Kachin state. I've looked at that law. I just, I cannot read that law as permitting not adding those names when you have such voluminous evidence uh, that shows the troops under their command have committed serious human rights abuses. I, I, you know, as a legal matter, I don't understand how they can justify it. And I think it would be good strategy. Um, I think, you know, final point, the, the 20, 30 years of struggle to get to this point, <clears throat> support by the U.S. Congress, presidents of both parties, we, we didn't go through all of that just to bring Burma up to a kind of halfway house between democracy and dictatorship, to be like another one of those Asian countries where you have elections from time to time, but really the same group of people have the money and the power all of the time. 
If we had wanted that, we could have settled for it years ago and cut a deal with the military and gotten rid of the sanctions. That's not what the policy was about. Um, so let's keep our eyes on the ultimate prize and let's hold on to some of our cards that we need to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Quigley. Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Um, and thank members and staff of the Tom Lance Human Rights Commission for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as you know, since mid-2011, Burma has undergone some changes, both positive and negative. The international community responded quickly to what it perceived to be an astonishing pace of reforms in the country, rushing to lift sanctions in an attempt <clears throat> to encourage more reforms. But much like the Arab Spring's swift removal of Egypt's Mubarak has revealed the deep barriers that still remain to lasting genuine democratic governance in Egypt, Burma's fundamental barriers to genuine democracy, peace, and national reconciliation remain firmly in place. At the heart of Burma's problems are ethnic minority demands for federalism. The Burmese military equates federalism with the disintegration of the Union. This dichotomy has driven decades of military rule and conflict characterized by systematic and widespread war crimes and crimes against humanity. As the State Peace and Development Council plotted out its roadmap to discipline democracy, they drafted the 2008 Constitution to enshrine military control over the government and central government control over ethnic minorities. The 2008 Constitution is now the most difficult obstacle to securing lasting genuine democratic reform and national reconciliation in Burma. The 2008 Constitution guarantees supreme power to the military's commander-in-chief, as Tom mentioned. The military is not subjected to civilian control. It has the right to independently administer and adjudicate all affairs of the armed forces, including its budget. The Commander-in-Chief appoints the ministers for three significant security ministries, defense, border affairs, and home affairs, that controls the civil society and ethnic minorities. It holds 25% of the seats in each parliament on the national and state and regional levels. Moreover, the Commander-in-Chief can assume all powers, dismiss the government, and rule the country under martial law in the name of a state of emergency. The Constitution also specifically assigns the military primary responsibility for safeguarding the non-disintegration of of the Union, the non-disintegration of national solidarity, and the perpetuation of sovereignty. This is especially troubling as it is used to justify military persecution of civilians under a system of impunity. Amending the Constitution through the process outlined in the Constitution requires more than 75 percent of members of Parliament to vote in favor of a proposed amendment, guaranteeing the need for military support for an amendment to move forward. The military supremacy in constitutional matters is further outlined in Article 20 of the Constitution, which states the Tatmadaw has primary responsibility for safeguarding the Constitution. In addition to legally enshrined political power over civilian arms of the government, civil society, and ethnic minorities, the Burmese military has demonstrated it will continue to use the same military tactics to control and persecute Burma's ethnic minorities. Um, as our Ano spoke about the Kachin. I just add a little bit about the Rohingya. On the western coast of Burma, an Arakan state, um, a human rights humanitarian crisis began to flare up in June 2012. A state of emergency was declared and the Burmese military sent in to restore order. Despite some cases in which the military did protect some Rohingya communities, the military and other security forces participated in and failed to prevent further systematic attacks against the Rohingya in October 2012. The situation of the Rohingya remains incredibly precarious with the threat of further attacks looming and the denial of humanitarian access a growing crisis of its own. Mistakenly, many in the international community have overestimated the significance of tentative ceasefire agreements that have been signed over the past 14 months between the Burmese government and several ethnic minority groups. This isn't to say it is not a positive step. This, there is deep mistrust between the Burmese government and the various ethnic groups. Coming to the table and finding areas of agreement is a positive first step. The process towards peace and national reconciliation will be long. There are many fundamental disagreements that remain that will be difficult to reconcile. First, with the exception of the Kachin, who I will focus on shortly, the Burmese government and ethnic groups agreed the first step should be a ceasefire. In reality, the Burmese army, who only occasionally attend the peace talks, have been selective in which parts of the agreements they will adhere to and which they will disregard outright. The ceasefire agreement with the Shan State Army South has been violated numerous times, eroding the Shan State Army's trust in the negotiations with the Burmese government's peace teams. Second, there is disagreement on the next phase of negotiations. The Burmese government peace team wants to discuss economic development, whereas the ethnic groups want national political dialogue that leads to amending the 2008 constitution outside of the parliament in the process of a political dialogue. 
This is unacceptable to the Burmese government who states the ethnic groups need to form political parties, contest in the 2015 elections, and try to amend the constitution through the parliamentary process. The Burmese military, on the other hand, wants to defend the constitution as is. Third, the Kachin had a ceasefire from 1994 to 2011. They're unhappy with the Burmese military regime's violations of that ceasefire and the realization that a ceasefire did not bring about genuine political reform that recognizes their rights. They will not agree to another ceasefire without political dialogue and a process to guarantee their ethnic rights. The lifting of major international economic sanctions last year has removed critical leverage needed to move this difficult but essential process forward to guarantee national reconciliation. Indeed, the ethnic groups asked the international community to keep sanctions and not allow investment until the military attacks have stopped and political dialogue had secured them rights to self-determination, resource allocation, and ethnic rights. By prematurely lifting the investment sanctions, the international community is endorsing the Burmese government's approach. Critical leverage is lost and investment-related human rights violations have risen, not only in ethnic areas but central Burma as well. The Obama administration has moved the goalposts on requirements necessary to lift sanctions. Congress needs to reassert its leadership role on Burma and reimpose the original ben benchmarks needed for sanction removal. The United States must maintain the remaining sanctions, renew the sanctions and sanctions authorities that will expire, including the National Emergency and the Burmese Freedom and Democracy Act. Furthermore, the United States must prohibit military to military relations until the Burmese army ceases attacks and gross human rights violations. The victims of Burma's military's ongoing perpetration of war crimes and crimes against humanity deserve justice and accountability. The international community must reinvigorate the international effort to establish a commission of inquiry into these atrocities. The United States government needs to send a clear, distinct message that we stand with Burma's ethnic minorities in their struggle for national reconciliation and an end to impunity. The road to genuine democracy, peace, and national reconciliation is long and hard, but we must show the people of Burma that the United States is not a friend of Naypyidaw, but a friend to those who have suffered long enough. And I'd just like to add at the end that some of the remarks that Patrick um, made, we sort of feel were disingenuous. Um, ethnic minorities feel abandoned and isolated um, and had, that they've lost the support of the United States government. Um, there, there has not been um, concrete, sustained efforts by the U.S. to engage the ethnic nationalities in a public fashion. There have only been very reluctant backdoor efforts in which they've not put forward um, wholeheartedly. Second, the issue of access, humanitarian access for the Kachin. Um, it has been 20 months that that conflict has gone on, and the only approach the U.S. And, and the international community have taken to addressing the humanitarian crisis and access to 66,000 IDPs has been to ev relentlessly ask the Burmese government for permission. They have not attempted in 20 months to provide that assistance directly when that is the avenue in which that problem could be addressed. Um, and they're not addressing the fact, they use that as an excuse to not address the underlying issue that talks with the Kachin Independence Army and the Burmese Army will go nowhere unless something is changed by the international community. Thank you very much. And last but not least, my former colleague uh, from Maine, the Honorable Tom Andrews with the United to End Genocide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your leadership not only on this commission, uh, Mr. Chairman, but also your leadership and your clarion call for human rights uh, throughout the Congress, throughout your career. Uh, I've been an advocate for human rights and democracy in Burma since the year I was elected to the House uh, to represent the 1st Congressional District of Maine. That same year, 1990, Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy won an overwhelming victory uh, in Burma. I went to Congress she went to prison. Suu Kyi's movement from prison to house arrest to parliament is truly remarkable, and reforms ushered in by Burma's President Tin Sen, as you've heard, should be recognized and rewarded by the United States and the international community. But the fact of the matter is, a great deal has not changed in Burma, and it's precisely because of international pressure, in many cases led by the United States, and in many cases pushed by the Congress of the United States, that change in Burma came about in the first place. Abandoning this leverage prematurely jeopardizes progress and condemns those who, suffer, who continue to suffer in Burma to more of the same. As you've heard at this hearing, more of the same is a significant reality for significant numbers of people. 
Last year, during elections that secured Aung San Suu Kyi a seat in Parliament, I was in Kachin State, where I saw the devastation of this government's policy. I went to many abandoned villages. I heard stories of killing, forced disappearances, death from disease, because displaced populations have largely been cut off from international humanitarian aid. And as you've heard at this hearing, things have gone from bad then to worse now. Unfortunately, Kachin State is not alone. The Rohingya ethnic minority, a long persecuted minority of approximately one million people, have lived in the Rakhine state of Western Burma for many generations. Deadly sectarian violence erupted there last June, as you've heard, and again in October. State security forces not only failed to protect the Rohingya, they were responsible for killings, for beatings, for mass arrests, while obstructing access to humanitarian aid for victims. Behind these attacks, are conditions that point to ethnic cleansing and genocide. In addition to being brutalized, the Rohingya have been stripped of their citizenship and face restrictions on their ability to travel and even marry. These attacks and restrictions are not imposed because of what the Rohingya might have done. It is because of who they are. Hate speech is pervasive and ominously reminis uh, reminiscent of the hateful propaganda directed at the Tutsi population and their sympathizers in the lead up and during the Rwandan genocide. Last year, President Tinsen effectively proposed the ethnic cleansing of the entire area where Rohingya citizens have lived for generations. He called on the expulsions of all Rohingya, or if no nation would take them, that they be put into camps. While he has since modified how he speaks about the Rohingya and has made commitments, as you have heard in this hearing, to the President of the United States, the policies of the government, the actions of this government, and the actions of the Burmese military when it comes to this ethnic minority speaks volumes. Actions speak louder than words, Mr. Chairman. These conditions have pushed thousands of Rohingya to flee on overloaded boats, as you pointed out. 1,800 refugees washed up on Thailand shores just last month, and the United Nations estimates that at least 485 refugees have known to have drowned. In light of these brutal realities, the administration's approach of, and I'm quoting them, gentle persuasion and positive reinforcement must be re-examined and challenged by this Congress. Congress needs to know if the lifting of most forms of pressure on this regime and invitations to military exercises to this brutal military uh, apparatus and a visit by the President of the United States might be sending an unfortunate signal to some that violence, discrimination, systematic human rights violations, and the disenfranchisement of an entire people may indeed be acceptable. Reforms in Burma are tenuous and reversible. Hundreds of political prisoners remain behind bars, as you have heard, and some of those who were released are now back in prison. While total bans on the right of public assembly have been lifted, those who participate in public demonstrations not only need a permit, they have to have their slogans pre-approved by the regime or face arrest. There are several steps that the United States Congress can and must take, Mr. Chairman, and I provided the committee with a comprehensive list of recommendations in my written testimony. But the bottom line is this. Congress needs to exercise its oversight role that includes a focus on the ongoing killing of civilians, restrictions of humanitarian aid, the military's attacks and gross human, viol human rights violations in Kachin and Rakhine State, the widespread displa displacement caused by pandemic lab grab land grabbings, as you've heard, the dominance of the military over civilian authorities, and political prisoners who remain behind bars. Congress should push the administration to call for a United Nations Commission of Inquiry that covers not only recent violence in Rakhine and Kachin states, but anywhere else where abuses are taking place. It is imperative that the U.S. government be clear that continued abuses will be met with consequences and that rewards giving up to this point are also truly reversible. I understand the desire to declare Burma a success story. But success is not marked by removing sanctions. It's marked by lasting change for the people of Burma who have endured endless suffering under a brutal military regime. 
let us reward gen genuine progress, but let us not condemn the people of Burma, particularly those living in ethnic minority states, to the consequences of a long oppressive military regime that is suddenly freed of accountability and consequences for its behavior. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for your leadership and for this hearing, which I believe could be a valuable first step toward a reexamination and a resetting of U.S. Burma policy. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of you um, for your patience and for sitting here through this entire hearing and, uh, and for your comments and your advice. Um, uh, we don't have this room for very long, so I want, I'm going to be. I'm going to just throw a bunch of questions out, and um, whoever wants to answer them can. If you don't want to answer them, that's okay too. Um, but let me I just briefly, just to all of you. I mean, you you, you heard the administration witnesses uh, just before you. Are, are you are you reassured or are you more anxious uh, after um, after the testimony? I mean, I, I asked specifically. Um, you know, on the issue of, 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 of the military, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, uh, there were any plans to kind of ease uh, relations, and the answer seemed to be no um, until there's progress. I, I, I'm just curious, help me understand what made you feel good and what made you feel not so good about what you just heard from the administration. Any, anybody? Everybody or anybody? Do you want? Mr. Malinowski? Sure. Uh, I, I, I find myself agreeing with all the words, or most of the words. Um, there is a commendable emphasis on the primacy of human rights right. in the relationship, transparency, anti-corruption, um, staying the course, taking our time. But what I worry about is that I, 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 don't, I don't have the sense that they really know how to use leverage very well, that, that the, the, the old habit of, of, of saying, we will do X if you do Y, but not until you do Y, is, is being lost. The, have, we, have we given too much and gotten too little in return so far? I think we've given, uh, you know, I mean, we, we may not agree 100 percent on that. I, I think that, that it, it was a good idea to lift most of the investment ban, but not all of it. Um, I think some of the sanctions did need to be eased, but, but I think that allowing, for example, engagement uh, by U.S. companies with the state uh, really military-dominated oil and gas company in Burma was too much of a concession um, to interests that were not really um, human rights interests. Let's put it that way. So I think holding them to, to the use of leverage to achieve the goals that they have outlined is, is the key. And Congress holds the key to some of that leverage because you renew the legislation. Ms. Quigley? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been very critical of, um, one, the pace of the response that the U.S. has done, feeling as if, you know, not, was, not enough was given by the Burmese government before we gave something. And so uh, what's of concern to us yet, like, I agree with Tom, like, the words sound great. We don't feel that their actions match their words. Um, that, that's one thing that's very concerning to us. When we've had discussions about military, it's military relations, um, they, they say, okay, you know, it's going to be human rights and it's going to be seminars, and then they're invited to Cobra Gold. Um, and there, there was, in our opinion, a PR fail in explaining what the Burmese military is two officers and it's observers and they're not participants and all that. The message that was per sent basically to Burma and to the ethnic nationalities was the Burmese military, without having reached any benchmarks or having accomplished something, now has a prestigious relationship with the U.S. military. Um, it was not perceived in Burma as what it was viewed here by DOD or by the State Department. I mean, there's a lot of concerns we have going forward when it comes to them saying we're not going to do mil to mil trainings, but then we hear, well, we have to dangle carrots out to the U.S. We have to dangle carrots out to the military. That's the only approach that we really have for the military. And for us, we feel as if the signals that this has been sending to the Burmese military is it's condoning the violence. It's condoning right. the approach that they continue to take because there are no consequences for it. Like Tom said, they they are underestimating the value of leverage, um, and it's and it's not being used to the extent that we feel as if it is. I think that the administration has recognize that sanctions played a role in getting us to the point that we ha we are now. Right. Um, but I don't think, you know, and if, you know, I know this is a bit self-aggrandizing, but that pressure and threats, you know, when there was a commission of inquiry 
campaign from the NGO groups for supported by Congress, supported by the administration, um, you know, cable traffic would come back and we'd hear how, how worried Burmese military officials were that they'd be sent to the ICC, that there would be a commission of inquiry and it would make that recommendation. Um, and I don't think that that's something that we should be giving up. Right. I think that using that psychological- Has the, has the administration given that up? Yes. They have? Yes, they have. practice, yeah. Not, yeah. not outright. Not correctly, but- Yeah. 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 But, but I, I, so I know. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I really support when the Tom and Andrew said um, change happened in Burma, and because uh, because of pressure, pressure must continue. And I I believe in the future the U.S. can play an important role in exposure for our national military, but not now. It's because that the Burmese army is almost hundred percent Burman with al almost no representative from ethnic area. Before we give legitimacy and support, the military must have representative from entire country and not continue to attack against the ethnic group. Additionally, the military is responsible for many human rights violations with 100% impunity. So before we strengthen the military, we need an independent judiciary and justice system to prevent future impunity. That's Thank what I want. Mr. Simons. Yeah, very briefly, uh, my impression is that, that Assistant Secretary Posner and his bureau are doing an admirable job of trying to keep the focus on human rights and democracy, but that is not necessarily where the shots are being called on administration policy with respect to Burma. Uh, and if if there were another hearing on on Burma, I think the the people you would you might want to talk to would be folks like Assistant Secretary Fernandez at the uh, Economics Bureau at the State Department, uh, officials from OFAC and Treasury, uh, officials from the Department of Commerce, from the Department of Defense, because where I would question uh, the testimony in the first panel is whether there really is a whole government approach in which human rights is central. Uh, to the uh, administration's policy. It's certainly central to the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, um, but I don't know that, that all parts of the government are on the same page in that approach. Tom, you have anything to add? Only, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you know, this, this change didn't happen because the military leaders woke up one morning in Burma and said, oh my goodness, what have we been doing? We have to have change. Right. We've been wrong. It happened precisely because of pressure. That's why. So where's our leverage with, with the Burmese military? I mean, how do, I mean, I mean, it, it, again, maybe I'm missing something here, but the, the administration panel basically said really we haven't, they haven't done much with the military other than that um, having uh, some observe, observers at, at these military exercises. But uh, I mean, I mean what, Where's our leverage with the military? What should we be doing with the military, um, you know, to get them to, to move forward and to reform? Well, Mr. Malinowski? I'd, you know, I'd personally be a lot more comfortable with uh, engagement with the military and inviting them, the right ones, to exercises if we also exercised the stick of the SDN list. In other words, if, if we followed the stated policy, which is to reward reformers and to engage them, while continuing to do everything we can to disadvantage those who are standing in the way of reform. So the fact that no military officer has been added to the SDN list right. in the last four years, despite clear evidence. Well, I'm going to make sure know, they get all so those, the information that we have received from many of you about the, the two individuals that I mentioned. Uh, and that would, you know, setting aside just the legal obligation, right. the message that would send to the military ranks is, number one, the United States is still watching what you are doing. Right. And you are going to get left behind. The country is moving forward economically, politically. You individually, personally, are going to get left behind if you are seen as commanding troops in battle who are doing these kinds of things. That is, from a tactical point of view, important, even as your colleagues who may not be commanding those troops are getting invitations to Cobra Gold. Well, you are, you are all the experts here. I mean, are there reformers in the military, in the Burmese military, that you believe that we can encourage and, and support? Yeah, there, there are different kinds of people in every institution. and Even um, in Congress, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and look, it's not, 
I mean, you know, Thane Sane surprised a lot of people. He was, he was a regional commander in the Shan state, and I, certainly there were not, um, you know, his troops were not angels um, when he commanded them in the Shan state at that time, and yet he has surprised a lot of us, including myself. So I think if you, if you have the right carrots and the right sticks, the right combination of encouragement, reward, but also um, stigma for those who hold the process back, then I think we can get to where we want to go, including with the military. Right. Go ahead. I, I just want to say, I think one thing that um, we'd like to see is, is Congress um, taking a more assertive role. Um, you guys have led Burma policy for, for 20 plus years. I feel as if in the past sort of year, Congress has, has um, let the administration sort of run, run, run with it, and right. sort of run Burma policy. And I think one of the things that we'd like to see is a return to Congress's role in setting priorities and benchmarks. You know, one thing that of great concern to us today was there's this 50 businessmen delegation with Assistant Secretary Fernandez in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the big push is to get her names removed from the SDN list. And we really think Congress really needs to be assertive in setting certain benchmarks. Individuals to be removed from the list need to meet certain requirements to get their name off the list. I mean, we were very concerned last week when four banks um, who are on the SDN list, their sanction where wait was waived. Um, and you're allowed to do business with these banks. But nothing was stated that these banks had actually met any requirements for being removed from these Patriot Act sanctions. All that was mentioned was, this is to make it easier for U.S. businesses to invest in Burma. And for us, we're like, when did that become the U.S. standard on, on Burma right. policy? You know, and, I, and I think that the response would be that there were no other banks that are operating in Burma, that uh, you know, that, where, where you could do business, which is not, a, which is not, a, which is not a good reason to do it. But it's um, let me let me let me just say, you know, uh, President uh, Thein Sen. I mean, I mean, is is he committed? Do you believe, you believe he's committed to the creation uh, of a democratic civilian representative government in Burma, or you know, are they attempting to preserve military control over the government by you know implementing partial reforms designed to end sanctions on their country? I'm just, I'm because again, I'm trying to figure out as we move to the next step here. Um, I mean, Ms. I know you could be, be, maybe you might be able to answer that question. Um, you know, is this um, is is the president? Uh, do you believe committed to the kind of reforms uh, that we're all talking about here? That if he could, he would. Um, move things forward in the way that we all believe they should move forward? Well, it's okay. Not she, ha she actually has some very strong opinions. She just sometimes needs a little... Oh, no, and I understand that. I, I want to make sure that... Sorry. Um, yeah. What I see our President Deng say, he is a good, good person, personality. But um, what I see is two reform of Obama, we uh, really not, even one good person cannot really do. We need a really, um, uh, how to say, um, a grant, a guarantee for the, all the people. Uh, we need a consti constitutional reform. So that will lead uh, for the good of the, the good for the people of Burma. So what I see is that President now President Tainsey he ordered many times for three times for the ceasefire, and he gave promise many things, but it's not in the ground. It's not really implement what he said. So yes, he is a good personality, but I don't see any any right now. I don't see any that reform is mm. taking place. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Let, let, me, let, me, let me just say, I mean, I, I think it is probably correct to say that, you, you know, we have, Congress has kind of sat back a little bit while the administration has taken the lead, and we've seen some incredible things. Aung San Suu Kyi was here in the Capitol, uh, you, know, you know, being recognized, and um, she's out of prison, and, um, you know, um, and, uh, and so on one level, We've seen some extraordinary developments. But as you've all pointed out, you know, there's this other part of it, which is, uh, is there systematic reform? 
You know, is there is there you know is and and our and our and our and are the policies that we're pursuing aggressively trying to promote U.S. business opportunities over there um, with reporting requirements that I think we would all agree are not particularly um, as tough as we would like them to be. You know, in terms of making sure that there's a high standard uh, in terms of respect for human rights. But um, I mean. Uh, you know, we have we, we we've, we've kind of we've we've sat back uh, pretty much and, and let the administration kind of call the shots, and, and things have been moving pretty rapidly. But I guess the question now is, what do we do? What, what should Congress do in, in its oversight role? You know, what do we need to do in the short term, in the mid, in the medium term, in the long term, to ensure that the reforms that everybody wants actually move forward? Um, you know, you talked about the lists, and we've talked about. Um, you know a few other things. I would I would encourage all of you to to work with this commission to help kind of guide us on some of the short term steps that need to be taken immediately. Look, I I I, I, we're, I think we we are this is all about human rights. You know, so we want we want to see more U.S. investment overseas, but we want to see it done in a way that promotes human rights, not just for the sake of U.S. companies exploiting uh, people who are not uh, whose whose rights are not being respected. So. You know, you know, any guidance that you may have, you know, and we can we can all kind of close with this. any any advice of what we need to do right now. What if, if we if Congress could do something right now, um, what would be the most important thing for us uh, to focus on? Ms. Um, um Well, th there's so one. I don't know if you consider this immediately, but the Burmese Freedom and Democracy Act, right. the import ban has to be renewed every summer before the end of July, or it expires. The GEM provision that bans jadeite and rubies from coming into the country um, is part of that. It was originally from the Jade Act, but then was written specifically to feed into the Burmese Freedom and Democracy Act right. import ban. Um, that will expire. That's actually the only um, import sanction that remained in place. In November, when Obama issued a waiver for the import ban, he kept the GEM ban. But if Congress doesn't renew the Burmese Freedom and Democracy Act okay. this summer, right. we lose an additional sanction. So that's why when we say those that expire, right. you know, renew them. Thank you. Um, we also think legislation that puts into place benchmarks for removal from the SDN list, removal of further sanctions, you know, legislation that clearly states what that should be, we think that that would be advantageous for Congress to send that message. Right. But the law is already in place for what the, the, the administration was I incorrect when I said that they had an obligation to update the list? Or was or, um, that's what the law it, okay. the law literally says that they have an obligation to update the list as new information comes in, right. and so that there is a matter of just you know really exercising oversight over OFAC and the State Department, and more the State Department because you know OFAC is not a policy making institution; they right. implement. The, the policies that are set at the White House and, and, and the State Department. They, the State Department needs to send a signal that the list needs to be updated with this information. Uh, I, I agree with, with Jen's other recommendations. Um, absolutely, we need, we need standards for, for how to use the SDN list dynamically over the next two or three years. And that will include taking people off the list. That's appropriate. But what are the standards right. for doing that? Um, and then maybe just a more, a more general point in answer to your mm. previous question. We can't put all of this on two individuals in Burma, right. whether it's Dane Sain or Aung San Suu Kyi. She in particular, um, she is my hero. I assume she is your heroine as well. But she faces extraordinary constraints right now as a member of parliament focusing almost single-mindedly on trying to negotiate with the military for a change in the Constitution in 2015, which means it's hard for her to speak out about most of the things that we have been talking about. Uh, one person told me that she's gone from house arrest to lower house arrest, <laughs> which you may sympathize with. Um, so what she counts on us to do is to do our part, not just wait for instructions, but to do our part to carry the policy that we have put into place over the last 20 years to its logical endpoint of full democracy in Burma. Mr. Andrews. Mr. Chairman, I think what is required right now is for the Congress to be more, more precise and more prescriptive in the laws that it sets regarding U.S. policy in Burma. There are a lot of waivers that have been exercised by the administration. And I think we have to look at the impact of those waivers and recognize that the legislation that you've established 
uh, providing for the great flexibility uh, may need to be reined in. I think some of the specific appropriations measures, for example, need to make sure that the right aid is getting to the right people, particularly in Kachin State, for example. You can make that very prescriptive. Uh, the call for a United Nations Commission of Inquiry. I mean, many of the specific things that have been mentioned in this panel, and I certainly have um, made specific recommendations in my written testimony, all of those can be more precisely put into the legislation with less maneuverability uh, to, uh, to ignore them. The other point is that the Congress has asked for several reports and findings from the administration, uh, many of which have gone, frankly, ignored. And I think that the uh, Congress should, could be more vigilant in calling upon the administration to be much more responsive and responsible. Mr. Simons? Yes, thank you. Sino? Um, yeah, to support Tom's and, and Jen's comment, for the Congress, please set clear benchmarks for lifting sanction and continuous engage, engagement with the Burmese, uh, uh, with Burma, and also the State Department chain their targets. Uh, we need to give clear target to the Burmese government. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, all, all I would add is just to. Uh, an emphasis on that, the oversight role, not just with respect to the administration, but also with respect to uh, the World Bank and the right. ADB uh, and its, uh, its current lending uh, to Burma. Right. And, I, and, look at, and I appreciate these recommendations. I would just close with saying this, uh, that, uh, it, you know, um, you know as, as things develop, it would be very helpful to this commission if you have specific recommendations as things are unfolding that we should, you know, uh, weigh in on this issue or that issue, or you know, express concern about these individuals who are not on the list. I mean, I think we, I think we, we have a little bit of a roadmap here to kind uh, of of things that we ought, we ought to do. But um, you know, look, I, I think, and I, I think we all kind of feel the same. I mean, some some incredible things have have happened, um, and there's this great potential, and we, and I think all of us want to make sure that we just don't mess this opportunity up, that this potential blossoms and that, that uh, the people of Burma have a, have a much brighter and better future, uh, and one where everybody is respected, uh, eth inclu including the ethnic minorities who are now under, under, great, uh, under great attack. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, everybody on, the, on this commission, you know, want, wants to be helpful here, so please, uh, please stay in touch with us, and I appreciate very much your testimony. Um, I've learned an awful lot today, <laughs> so uh, I have a lot to digest, but I, I thank you very much, and the hearing has come to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.